Well, hi, everybody. This is Ron Miller, and I'd like to welcome you once again to the Bishop's Corner here on Annunciation Radio, WNOC 89.7 in the greater Toledo area, WHRQ 88.1 in Sandusky, WFOT 89.5 in Mansfield, WSHB 90.9 in the Willard area, WRRO 89.9 in Bryan, and WLBJ 104.1 in Faustoria. Uh, folks, there's a couple other great stations that Carry the Bishop's Corner in Northwest Ohio, WSJG in Tiffin, and WJTA in Lipsick. Uh, the Bishop's Corner is heard every Thursday, and it's rebroadcast several times uh, throughout each weekend. You can check that broadcast schedule at uh, the Annunciation Radio website, www.annunciationradio.com. Or also, folks, uh, you can also get a free app for your uh, Annunciation Radio uh, playing on uh, either your uh, Android or your Apple iPhone. Uh, Do you know that, Bishop? I think it's great. (laughs) We are technologically astute, Ron. And some of you, of course, are watching online. Hello to you. and uh, Greetings, folks. Glad to have you with us. And uh, let's welcome Bishop Thomas. Hello, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. Hello, and I hope everyone's using all the technology they can (laughs) to access Annunciation Radio and the Bishop's Corner. We're trying to reach people in today's technology. And once again, I have to tell you, Ron, and all our listeners and viewers, I don't go to an event in a parish setting or otherwise in the diocese where I don't have at least one person say, Bishop, I follow the Bishop's Corner, I listen to Annunciation Radio, and thanks for answering my question, or, you know, I'm glad to hear all those answers that you have, and I can't tell you how grateful I am, and how grateful I am for our listeners and viewers. I'm delighted that they're with us. And I was in Mansfield, of course, which is about, probably as far away as we can get from Toledo and in the diocese. Sure. On last Friday night and probably had 20 people come up to me and Isn't that talk great? to me about the show. And, so if I can't be know. physically close to them geographically, we can be physically close yes. over the airwaves, yeah. which is a great gift as the shepherd of the diocese to be close to everyone so that they are able to reach out and Absolutely. feel our presence. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, before we get to our gospel, what's on your mind? I, you, don't, you don't have anything coming up. Do you? <laughs> Nothing we'll, to do. I think we'll talk also about those few things a little later in the yeah. show. But Ron, just just a few notes, if I may, of, of literally a number of diocesan events and things that are happening to ask people's prayers and also to inform them on some uh, events. So one of the, of course, one of the things I can mention is asking for prayers, and I've been doing this over my own social media, for all those young people who are being confirmed mm-hmm. in this Easter season. So there are lots of confirmations, folks, that have been taking place. There are group cathedral confirmations on Saturdays and even in the evenings, mm-hmm. and there are numerous uh, parish confirmations that have been taking place on the weekends at weekend liturgies and on Sundays, obviously, and week evenings. But just to encourage that, because it's the Easter season, isn't it, where the whole church from Easter Sunday until Pentecost, 50 days later, awaits a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So do please remember all of these young people, the majority of whom are eighth graders, and remember their intentions that they might literally experience the indwelling of the Spirit as a result of this sacrament, and then manifest that indwelling to all who they meet. Then there's a few more things if I can mention, Ron. Sure. If we have time. Absolutely. <laughs> this coming it's your show, Bishop. There you go. <laughs> this coming Saturday, I'll celebrate with great joy the Neophyte Mass in our cathedral at the 5 p.m. vigil. So mm-hmm. everyone is welcome to join us. And that's, of course, the Mass where we invite all of those folks who have newly entered the church. Mm-hmm. So those folks who were baptized and received into the church at the Easter vigil, those who perhaps were converts and came into the church. And it's all of these, if you will, our newest Catholics, Hmm. and to encourage their faith, to encourage the practice of their faith, and to gather as one, if you will, new family there in our cathedral. Is that a new tradition? No, it's been going on certainly here in the diocese for a number of years, I know, and I'm delighted to continue it. it's wonderful. So please come and join us for that. And then on Sunday, which is the 7th of May, it is the World Day of Prayer for Vocations. Mm. So I I would invite all of our good folks to share with us that moment of prayer and intention for an increase in vocations in particular to the priesthood and consecrated life, especially for the diocesan priesthood, obviously in the Diocese of Toledo. 
All right, good. All right, well, Bishop, if we, uh, if it's okay with you, we'll head to our gospel. Please do. All right, and of course, it's a recent gospel from Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred, and it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, has astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on further. But they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them, and it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them, who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. First thoughts, Bishop. What a splendid gospel, first of all, and a gospel well known to so many of us as the road to Emmaus and those two disciples. Of course, folks, we know that this is recounted for us on the third Sunday of Easter, but it's recounted because it was also an event that happened on Easter night itself, Easter Sunday night. And there's those wonderful, simple words of those disciples who, despite the fact that they really were confused that this person that they were meeting, who was the risen Jesus, but hidden from their sight. And it's beautiful that as he begins to break open the scripture and they begin to be enamored by all that he's saying, they invite him, stay with us. So I think that's one phrase that we can use, especially because notice what happens when he arrives and he says, well, what are you discussing? Well, we're told that they look down, they look downcast and they're stopped in their tracks. And aren't we sometimes downcast? Aren't we sometimes dejected? Don't we sometimes feel even abandoned by the Lord? But yet the risen Lord comes right into our situation and he reveals himself to us. So I think first, I would say that beautiful invitation, especially when I might be dejected or downcast or challenged or with some difficulty, stay with us, stay with us, Lord. And then I think it's important, and I know I might have mentioned it before, Ron, but Mm. I think geographically, it's a beautiful example in this gospel that they were going from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and we know they were traveling from the east to the west. So they were going toward the sunset, Mm. away from dawn or the sunrise. They were going away from the empty tomb, away from the experience of the resurrection, and toward darkness. Mm. And so the direction that they were going is then turned around after they recognize Jesus and the breaking of the bread. Literally, in the darkness of the night, they get up and they make their way back to Jerusalem toward the dawn, toward the light, toward the resurrection, Mm. toward darkness the brethren and those who were disciples who believed in his resurrection. So I think we have to be conscious that if we're traveling toward the darkness, we need to make that turnabout somehow. And we need always to be concentrating every day. Am I concentrated on moving toward the dawn, which is Christ and always looking to his empty tomb 
and to be supported by others who believe that he's truly risen from the dead. Yeah. You know, as a convert, I get into discussions quite often, it seems like, with non-Catholics and, you know, about certain things and theology and things. And one of them, of course, is always the Eucharist. Sure. And the road to Emmaus is always a story I use. To Absolutely. Reaffirm that, yes, we know Jesus, and sometimes he may be walking right with us or whatever, but it's pretty clear there that their eyes were opened. When, in that moment in when that he broke moment, the bread. And moment. I think it's a wonderful remembrance, too, because here we have both, we have ultimately what the Mass is. So it's the breaking open of the Word and the sharing mm-hmm. of the breaking of yeah. the bread, which is the Eucharist. So yeah. in every Mass, the Word is broken up unto us, the Word which reveals Jesus himself, as he did for those disciples on yeah. the road. And then there's the breaking of the bread at the altar, which, of course, is his glorified body yeah. and then blood. So Emmaus is a story that, in one sense, reveals the reality of what we celebrate today yeah, sure. in the Mass. And, you know, and it's also, I think, interesting that he, there's Jesus' words and then at the end, Luke reemphasizes it all right at the end. Absolutely. And says, this is what this was all about, how he was made known to them by the breaking of the bread. Right. And, and you know. that their eyes were opened. So I think we can pray that even in every mass yeah. that we attend, sure. our eyes might be further opened. That is the eyes of our soul yep. to the reality that Jesus is truly, really present in his risen body in the Eucharist. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. Folks, we have to take just a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we have a lot of questions. We do. (laughs) And we're going to get to them, folks. And we will. And as soon as we get back. And we are back here, folks, at the Bishop's Corner. Uh, The Bishop's always anxious to get your emails, folks. There's several ways you can get those to us. You could just Google the Bishop's Corner and click on... uh, uh, Annunciation Radio or the other way around, go to AnnunciationRadio.com, click on the Bishop Corner. Either way, you'll get a template that'll pop up. Uh, when you do that, just put your question right in there. Uh, the Bishop does ask that maybe you give him uh, the town you're from or the parish you're from or the li- or the station you're listening to, something that gives him a little At bit At least of a idea. first name, and right? first name. So right. that we can chat with you. We don't really love anonymous ones. To, we, we don't, do we, Bishop? I we think do. often we take them because the question <laughs> yeah. might be appropriate, but it, I really appreciate or folks a little sense when you might identify yourself by yeah. first name or, or parish or town. Yeah. So we are going to start with Tom and Sandusky it says, Dear Bishop Thomas, Easter Sunday's gospel from John seems to make a point of describing the burial cloths of Jesus and states that the cloth that covered his head was not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Do we know why it was in a separate place and why does the gospel make a point of this? I'm just curious. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom, so much for that thoughtful question. And I can tell you there have been volumes written by (laughs) biblical scholars on this question. But it brings to to mind a point, Tom, that, uh, and just recently you may have seen in the news, folks, that there have been further examinations of the Shroud of Turin, and there have been further examinations of what is known as the Sundarium of Oviedo in Spain. The Sundarium of Oviedo is believed to be that cloth which covered the face of Jesus Mm. and then was rolled up in a separate place. And of course, we know that the Shroud of Turin is believed to be that cloth which covered the body of the dead Jesus. And just recently, folks, you may have read that it's fascinating to me that further examination, scientific examination, has debunked those, quote, previous scientific examinations, which said that it was some sort of 15th century painting or 14th century forgery. And the more they study it, the more they're also recognizing the similarities between the face that is on that sudarium and the face that Uh is on the Shroud of Turin. So Tom, ultimately, are these actually the burial cloths? We simply do not know for sure, but there are many today who would say that they are. And what is the significance of them being placed in a certain way? There is always and only speculation. So there's nothing in Scripture that tells us exactly why. But it would be something, Tom, I would suggest to you, perhaps go to some scholars and perhaps even the fathers of the church so that you might be able to read some of the really 
uh, innumerable interpretations hmm. of just what the meaning of those things were. But for us, we cannot say definitively why they, it appeared that way. But what we can say is the gospel writer wanted to convey that the cloths were left there and they were left there for a purpose. And that purpose obviously is there was no body, but the cloths were present. So it reinforces the resurrection. And if those cloths are true, then the Shroud of Turin and the Sidarium of Oviedo also reinforce the resurrection. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Tom. We're going to go to, uh, uh, let's see, we're going to go to Marion Bellevue, who says, Dear Bishop, is there any news on filling the Episcopal vacancy in the Cleveland Diocese? <laughs> you must be getting tired of running back and forth, and we really need you here. It's like we are the sheep without a full-time shepherd. That's She says that's her words here. <laughs> I hope they announce a new bishop soon. And she says, please forgive me for editing sacred scripture. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, Mary in Bellevue, thank you so much to you and to all the wonderful folks in the Diocese of Toledo who have been so very generous in their support and their prayers. But I have to, I have to offer a, a, a gentle corrective, Mary. Actually, I am still your full-time shepherd, and I'm trying to be full-time. But, of course, I'm sharing that full-time, of course, with being the Apostolic Administrator in Cleveland. Uh, please know, folks, that there is no definitive time frame for this. And please know that it is not uncommon that a see would be vacant from perhaps six to nine months. So we just concluded, I just concluded the four month mark yeah. and that was April 28th. So I've been the administrator for four months and by God's grace, of course, no one could do this alone. And I am deeply, profoundly grateful for the wonderfully good folks and support that I have in the Diocese of Toledo and wonderfully grateful for the support of the good folks in the Diocese of Cleveland, which make it possible for me sure. to, to achieve these months of apostolic administration of Cleveland. And you're very gracious to say you must be tired. Uh, I confess now and then I might be, but I try to be like St. Francis of Assisi, who would say, Bro dear brother body, you just have to keep on going. So I tell brother body that often, Mary, but I hope you know that I am no less a shepherd for the people of the Diocese of Toledo and trying to be a good shepherd temporarily for the Diocese of Cleveland. All right. Thank you. And we're going to go to, so I don't get lost here, Bishop. We're going to go to uh, Janine and Mansfield. Uh, so, dear Bishop Thomas, I'm wondering more and more about what our Pope is saying and if he's trying to change the direction of our church. Recently, he said he thought it would be all right to have married priests in rural areas. A few months ago, the talk was about divorced people being able to receive Holy Communion. One news source says one thing and another news source says something else when Pope Francis says one of these things. I do listen to Catholic radio and I watch EWTN and I try to get the Catholic perspective on the news, but I am still concerned after we're listening to the newscast there. Can you comment, so please? Much. Thanks, Janine. Janine from Mansfield, thanks so very much for your sensitivity. And Janine, I have to say, and Ron, this is so true because we've discussed this, haven't we? Sure. Janine, you are not alone. And I think not alone because obviously it's clear that you want to have Catholic information, you want to receive the correct information, and you want to be guided by the church and the proper interpretation of things that are said. Sadly, Janine, the first difficulty, of course, is, and I've said this before, it's often that the Holy Father is speaking in Italian. When it's translated into English or other languages, it often misses the point of what he actually said. And tragically, we also know that certain news media pick up something he says, they pull a phrase, and then they go off with it where it might even be couched in very, very different language. So one of the things that you mentioned here was speaking about some married priests. And, you know, it's interesting, they pulled the quote, but they didn't give the context. So for example, Pope Francis said, you know, would married priests be a replacement for celibacy? Should celibacy go away? Absolutely not, he said. But we didn't read that in the press, did we? So if you go to what he actually said, then further down, he was speaking about mission areas where there haven't been priests and aren't priests, and maybe the people only see a priest once or twice a year. He was speaking about the possibility to consider examining what are called viri probati, 
proven men, and it might be that there's a possibility that they could be ordained. So notice how tenuous all of this is. Mm. Uh, so we have to be very mindful. The press presents it as celibacy should go away, and that's exactly what Pope Francis said should not happen. So I, I would say that sometimes the interpretation is a question, but I would encourage you, Janine, and others to be mindful of looking at an entire context of what might be being quoted and then also be mindful that the Holy Father himself, for example, in Amoris Laetitia, which is about caring for the divorced and remarried pastorally, he in fact says in that document, this does not change church teaching. So I think there is an effort on the part of some to create a Pope Francis and put words in his mouth, which in fact does not exist. So we have to be mindful and careful of that and pray that people get right interpretations and don't spin off an argumentation or discussion on topics that are really not in fact the reality. Okay, good. All right. Thank I'll you. try to sneak one more in here, Bishop. Please. Eric, Eric from Toledo. Dear Bishop Thomas, I've often heard that the Mass is referred to as the sacrifice of the Mass. Why is the word sacrifice used in this way? Thank you for providing an informative radio program. Thanks, Eric. Well, Eric, thanks for that encouragement for this radio program and for your listening. And, of course, the reality, the only reason the word sacrifice is used is because the Holy Eucharist, or Mass, are the unbloodied representation Calvary. and reality so, of the sacrifice on Calvary. So that's the reality. And in fact, if you go to your Catholic catechism, Eric, the Catholic catechism of the church, uh, number 1356, it speaks about the sacramental sacrifice, thanksgiving, memorial, and presence. So sacrifice is the terminology of the church, which has been used for centuries to refer to the mass or the Holy Eucharist, because it's the representation of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, offering himself in love to the Father. And that's exactly what we do in the Mass. With love, we offer him under the elements of bread and wine. We offer his body and blood to the Father as a sacrifice of praise. So that's the terminology, that's why it's used. And again, even in the Catholic Catechism, not only the word, but the concept appear as what we believe as Catholics. All right, good, thanks. Well, Bishop, we don't have any more time. How is that possible, Ron? <laughs> The gospel was too long. I, well, we've got, we can't complain about the gospel, Never complain right? about that. That's exactly. Um, I do have about 30 seconds or so. So the running back and forth, it is tough, I'm sure, and you're balancing it all. But you spoke to this real briefly, but knowing who we, you work with up here, I'm sure in Cleveland it's the same thing. You do have an amazing staff on both ends. Though, that and that's the greatest gift of all, because yeah. to have folks who are so dedicated to helping me do this, sure. helping me to accomplish it, those are the people I depend on and lean on. You know, folks will know that scripture where there was a battle and Moses was to hold up his hands, and if, the, if he kept his hands up, the battle would go their mm -hmm. way, or if he let his hands go down, it would not. And then his brothers, Aaron and his brother, they held his arms up so i must confess to you my it's a great analogy i have an awful lot of people holding my yeah, arms, arms up and right, supporting yeah. me and i tell people all the time folks the only reason i'm standing up is because of your good prayers so please continue them wonderful all right well we do have to go could we get a prayer and a blessing sure let's ask the lord's blessing for all of us heavenly father fill us with easter grace and as together with the whole church we await a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Strengthen us so that each day we might be able to say to your Son, Stay with us, Lord. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Good Thank time. you, everyone, for tuning in yeah. and watching, and see you here next week. Yeah, we'll see you again right here at the Bishop's Corner. You're going to get to hear him answer some of them, so stay right where you're at.